Okay, now shall we uh, start the uh, conference, uh, 100 years of world wars and post-war regional collaboration and good governance, how to make a new world order, uh, the second day. Uh, thank you very much for joining the conference. Um, my name is Satoshi Mizogata from Kyoto University uh, Institute of Economic Research. Uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, honorable uh, so, uh, and a great pleasure to organize the international uh, online conference. Uh, and I like to express my gratitude to all the participants. And uh, due to the uh, corona pandemic, we obliged to, to postpone our uh, schedule and to change the uh, con uh, conference style into online version. I, however, I believe the uh, conference becomes a good medicine for uh, stressful researchers. And uh, the conference is organized mainly by uh, Science Council of Japan, uh, Committee of Area, uh, Area Studies, uh, Subcommittee of Asia Regional uh, Cooperation and Academic Network, uh, Construction and uh, Committee of Economics. And uh, following organizations also uh, sponsor the uh, conference at Aoyama Gakuin University, uh, EU, uh, Euro European Commission, uh, Erasmus uh, Mandas uh, Funds, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, uh, Japan India uh, Bilateral Academic uh, Cooperation, uh, Kyoto University Institute of Economic Research, and uh, CHIR, uh, Committee of History of uh, International uh, Relations, uh, Paris and Milan, and a Sashimp newspaper. Okay. And due, due to adjust the schedule for European uh, Caribbean uh, and uh, US colleagues, uh, today we have a uh, keynote uh, session and two se additional sessions until 9.15 for a long time. I hope you enjoy the long and exciting this, uh, discussion over the uh, contemporary uh, topics. Okay, and at first I'd like to uh, to introduce uh, Professor Taka uh, Takaki Kajita, President of uh, SCJ, uh, Science Council of Japan. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the second day of the symposium, 100 years of world wars and post-war regional collaboration and good governance, which is organized by the Science Council of Japan, Committee of Asia Studies, Subcommittee of Asia Regional Cooperation and Academic Network Construction, and Committee of Economics. I'd like to give my sincere gratitude for the cooperation and collaboration from co-sponsors, Aoyama Gakuin University, Kyoto University, and Asahi Shimbun. My name is Takaki Kajita, President of the Science Council of Japan. To open the second day of the symposium, I'd like to extend my brief remarks on behalf of Science Council of Japan. Science Council of Japan was established in January 1949 as a representative of the Japan science community. It aims to promote and enhance the field of science and have science reflected in and permeated into administration, industries, and people's lives. It ranges over all fields of sciences, including humanities, 
social sciences, life sciences, natural sciences, and engineering. It represents Japan's scientists, both domestically and internationally, with the firm belief that science is the foundation upon which the civilized nation is built. Science Council of Japan is a deliberate and, sorry, the Science Council of Japan is to deliberate and realize important scientific matters and to promote communication of scientific research. Under these functions, it has engaged in various scientific activities so far. The major activities include recommendations to the government and public, establishment of networks among scientists, promotion of scientific literacy, and international scientific activities. In particular, it has deepened the partnership with academic societies across the world and promoted communication of international academic research in order to contribute the development of academia. As a part of such activities, it advocated the necessity of an international academy in the Asian region and contributed to establish the Science Council of Asia in year 2000. Now, Science Council of Asia consists of 32 academic organizations from 18 Asian countries and region. Um, in addition, with regard to the activities related to the promotion of scientific literacy, Science Council of Japan has organized academic forums, symposiums, and science cafes in order to give back scientific and academic research results to citizens. They have contributed to deepen mutual understanding of science and exchange opinions with the citizens and other stakeholders. The theme of this three-day symposium is 100 years of world wars and post-war regional collaboration and good governance, how to make a new world order, which is important for all the people around the world, including scientists and citizens. I'm very delighted that we have a large number of participants for the symposium. Since discussions among many people based on investigations of the past experiences are necessary for making new world order, I believe that discussions at today's symposium will be an important occasion toward further regional collaboration and good governance. To conclude, I sincerely hope that this symposium will be fruitful for all the participants. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Kajita. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to add one moment. Uh, so uh, this June, uh, the basic law on uh, science and technology in Japan was revised and uh, traditionally only natural sciences regarded as the science and technology, but uh, by re revision, uh, the humanity and the social science are uh, included in the field of science and technology. I believe now the importance of social science field has become important than before. So therefore, uh, needless to say, today's topic so reflects the political regime and, uh, has just, and try to provide the perspective of the new world order. And I think the, such uh, this such challenge is very, very uh, influential 
for the further development of the social sciences. So uh, for, for, for the big point of the, the, such uh, the Science Council of Japan, uh, this uh, trial is very challenging, is very, very important for the, all the uh, scientists. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to uh, hand the microphone to uh, Professor Haba for explaining the uh, contents of the uh, so, uh, symposium itself. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Middlewater. Um, my name is Kumiko Haba. Uh, to make a chair, uh, Professor of Aoyama Gakuin University, uh, Associate Member of Science Council of Japan, uh, to do chair with Professor Mizobata. First of all, I'd like to explain uh, the Japan National Tourism Organization, Gento, are uh, co-sponsoring. So we played a demo video on the Japan uh, National Tourist Organization five minutes before to the start. Um, that video is uh, introduced at Japan uh, and Japan tourism. Uh, that uh, uh, video will be held at the beginning of each session today and at Kyoto University as well. Sorry, yesterday we didn't prepare uh, to do so, um, but uh, because of coronavirus, COVID-19, professors from 12 countries uh, couldn't come to Japan, but when COVID-19 uh, converges, we very much welcome uh, you come to Japan. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to explain the uh, pro pro prospectus, sorry, uh, propose of the event. 100 years of world wars and post-war regional collaboration and good governance, how to make new world order. The world is currently at the major turning point under the crisis of COVID-19. The 100 years of pandemic has uh, hit in the world, infecting nearly 65 million people now and dying nearly 1.5 million people, awfully. According to WHO, 10% of world population is uh, already infected. It is almost 10 times more, 700 million. Just 100 years ago, a plague struck the world, the Spanish flu. This time, the United States, Europe, Latin America, Asia, and all over the world had been a great damage. The world is in pain, and we hope that many people will recover as soon as possible and that effective vaccines will be developed as soon as possible as well. The 20th century was a century of world wars. Two world wars occurred and the Cold War ruled the world after the two world wars. Amidst post-war devastation, the European Community under the Rome Treaty and the European Union under the Maastricht Treaty was formed in Europe. Europe has created peaceful governance by building economic collaboration, institutions, and established the rule of law. In Asia, ASEAN also pursues regional good governance after World War II. However, there is a new nationalism in, in the contemporary world. Populism is spreading in Europe, the US, Latin America, and Asia as well. There is a wave of rapid economic growth in rising countries, especially in China and India destabilization in search of democratization is spreading stimulus, stimulously in East Asia, East South Asia, South Asia, Middle East, North Africa, Central Africa, anywhere. In this field, based on the three waves in the 20th century, World War I, World War II, Cold War, 
what kind of regional institutionalization and regional good governance have been built up to avoid endless war and conflict. We will examine and consider what kind of order is needed to establish the conflict regions among both Europe, Asia, Latin America, and Africa. The theme of Tokyo and Kyoto conference organized by SCJ, Aoyama Gakuin University, Kyoto University, are to investigate and clarify how the countries that experienced the world wars have considered regional coexistence in each period and each region, and how to establish peace, stability, and prosperity under institutions and rule of law. We'd like to organize the Tokyo and Kyoto conference and discuss post-war regional cooperation and good governance in this transition period. We hope many scholars and young researchers will join us and discuss how to make new world orders from this unstable period of COVID-19 and nationalism, populism. Investigate, analyze, and discuss together. Please join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we'd like to ask the keynote speech uh, today um, from the midnight of the United States of America. We invite the um, main uh, editor of uh, Professor uh, Mr. Wataru Sawamura from Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wataru Sawamura. Please. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Right? Okay. Hi. Good evening. Okay. My name is Watara Sawamura. I'm a bureau chief of the Washington Bureau of the Asahi Shimbun. So thank you very much for a warm introduction, uh, Professor Haber. And it's my great honor to be a part of this well-timed and important online conferences. Uh, I am so delighted to share my thoughts in the same session with respective scholar, Emeritus Professor Chibata, Professor Shinzu, and Dr. Klaus Gise. I have been working for international news almost for 30 years, including six years in London and also four years in Paris as a correspondent. I also spent six months in Beijing as a visiting fellow at the Qinfa University. So since the summer of 2017, I've been staying in Washington, D.C. as a bureau chief, spending the last three years and a half to cover U.S. domestic policies and also foreign policy of Trump administration. So today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, what we should be we should keep in mind in the light of the dramatic change of U.S. administration with regard to the uh, perspective of the global order. What we could learn from the last four years of Trump administration with the very unconventional and also inconsistent foreign policy, and also what we could anticipate in coming years under the new presidency as a journalistic point of view. So as everybody is familiar with, the one of the most remarkable change in the United States foreign policy has been, of course, the US relation and attitude to China, which was dramatically deteriorated the last four years. As time passes, the keywords symbolizing the policy to China also has been changing. First the keyword was branding China as the divisionist power aiming to change the current status quo. 
And then next keyword, I had quite often heard in, in Washington DC was a pushback. China would sooner or later take over hegemonic position of the United States as sole superpower economically and militarily and technologically. Therefore, US should push back against the rise of China, they said. And then the next keyword was a punish China for market barriers against foreign investments and the intellectual property theft and so on. And then since last year, people are more and more talking about the term of decoupling with China, which implies China free supply chain and economy, not to be influenced by China's dominant market power. The question is whether this development of those keywords have been really, really reflected with the President Trump's carefully crafted strategy or not. My answer is no. I'd like to point out three points. The first, the most important goal for Mr. Trump is making big deals with world superpowers or strongman leadership flaunting his ability for making deals which previous presidencies would, would, would have not been able to achieve. For Mr. Trump, it is not a matter of good deal or bad deal. It's a matter of a big deal. Nobody doubts the rise of China. However, there's no evidence that Mr. Trump has made any efforts to architect comprehensive and coherent policy on how US would manage the rise of China. I interviewed a couple of times to Ambassador John Bolton, former security advisor to Mr. Trump. And he told me that only concerns for Mr. Trump were whether it would be beneficial for his reelection or for his legacy as the greatest president in US history. The second point, no matter how much Mr. Trump concerns China or not, they have been accumulating frustration against China among US policymakers, major industries, academics, regardless of political affiliation. There have been growing nonpartisan consensus among the Congress as well. So as Trump started the tariff war against China in 2018, those frustrations surfaced and blown out all at once. So according to the opinion poll, American public view on China has fallen to the lowest level, level, level ever. So it made Mr. Trump to realize that pressurizing China would be of advantage politically. Okay. Uh, sorry, my, now my PC is not, okay. Oh, here it comes with the vicious spiral. The third point, deteriorating of public view and sentiment toward China really comes from the pessimistic sense of the declining of the United States among American public. While I was covering the US presidential election campaign, I heard many times demanding US to get out of so-called world policeman or leader of global order and should more focus on the domestic issues such as infrastructure, healthcare, inequality, and so on. The American people now realize their malaise and difficulties caused by wealth inequality, educational gap, urban rural divide. Rich and poor divide is so significant that only wealthy 0.1% of the population has the same amount of fortune at the remaining 90%. That's also the reason why American middle class is leaning to anti-elite, anti-establishment populism. Yeah, according to opinion poll, the trust towards institutions such as Congress, bureaucracy, and the media, which are supposed to be a cornerstone of the American democracy, has significantly plummeted. Even among the younger generation is leading to prefer military rules than the democratic process 
Üç is worrying phenomenon. This illusion with liberal democratic value and the rise of undemocratic China economic and economically and militarily would invoke skepticism on US model and its traditional role in world order. In other words, this sense of declining US loss of self-confidence among American public, a major factor of growing uneasiness in China, which is accelerated with COVID-19 pandemic. I understand that today's symposium is for analyzing three major worlds in the 20th century and investigating how we would learn life path lessons and coexist peacefully. So my question is that handling relation between US and China would be leading to Cold War or not? In our newspaper, Sanshim, we discussed quite often if it is appropriate to name US-China relations would be early stage of a new Cold War or not. If you would just look at the broad context where two superpowers with a totally different view on democracy are competing each other to get to the hegemonic position in the various era, it really looks like the year Cold War. But as it is widely discussed, United States and China closely tied each other and as well in the various level. And they are interdependent. Both countries are not conducting a proxy war somewhere in the world, although they are competing zone of influence. Anyway, it is clearly different from the traditional Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. So I'd like to point out that the US and China share the same risk, which is growing frustration of middle class. As I said before, I was staying in Beijing as a visiting fellow to Tsinghua University before, where I had a lot of chance of interacting with Chinese young scholars and graduate students. So I had a strong impression that many of them are so frustrated and worried about their future, even though they were already part of promising Chinese elite. It was not because China's economic growth was not enough, but they were worrying about China's excessively competitive society, materialism, and the greedy capitalism, which created social inequality. They were also irritated that China was not respected enough by other countries internationally, in spite of economic success. So they were really frustrated with lack of the soft power of China. And now there is going to be new administration in the United States in 50 days. What we should keep in mind is that Mr. Biden would not straight back to softer engagement policy with China quickly. Like I said, the hardlining policy toward China had been already considered by partisan consensus especially people who were already nominated or who are going to be nominated are one or more critical against China in certain issues such as state-led Chinese industry policies and aggressive foreign policies. So we should remember as well that Biden won the election, flipping some of the last belt states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, where traditional manufacturing industries had gone to China and Mexico. I think he will not abandon protectionism nature totally, although Biden would not use the term America first. Mr. Biden has already declared to overcome the division and the polarization of the United States, but I think it is very, very difficult to get rid of the divisive legacy of Trumpism. Although I am personally against the use of the term of a new Cold War, the situation is very volatile and unstable, considering current competition and rivalry does not come from strength of the US nor China, but comes from weakness of both superpowers. It could be far more dangerous than the real Cold War as there is no effective deterrent between US and China. 
that is why I think it is essential for a new US administration to architect comprehensive strategy for China policy and manage carefully bilateral relations. I heard that in Japan, there is some voice with concern towards Mr. Biden's presidency for its returning back Obama era engagement policy to China. And also some expectations that Biden would be back to institution based foreign policies, internationalism, multilateral framework, traditional alliance policy, and so on. It is also true there is a common nature between Mr. Biden and the Prime Minister Suga of Japan, such as both are from commonality, not from political celebrity families. Long time as number two, nobody expected them to be number one. Both were non-nonsense type character and a practical minded person. But I think the Japan should not be satisfied with it unless Japan would be willing to be on the same page with the United States with regard to global agendas, Japan would not be treated as a partner and be left behind. Based on those contexts, I'd like to point out three keywords again, which I think are crucial concepts for US-Japan relations and its contribution for global order. First keyword is capability. Mr. Trump's four years really showed us that even global power and free and open democratic beacon country like United States might be fallen into populism with authoritarian touch. And COVID-19 has already shown that those populism is really in, in, ineffective and incapable to tackle against global crises such as a pandemic. Of course, we should not follow the same approach as in other authoritarian states. The most important priority for, uh, priority for Biden administration is ending the COVID-19 pandemic and rebuilding the economy. So it is essential for countries like Japan, South Korea, Germany, Australia, Canada, where we a fairly managed COVID crisis with keeping democratic norms and transparency would form like-minded nation of capability with the United States. We need recovery, but moreover, we need a good model of recovery. Second key word is a big picture. I think Japan should address its willingness to commit global issues with big picture, big concept, such as the public health crisis, climate change, nuclear proliferation, inequality, mass migration issues. It is said that Mr. Suga's signature policies are lowering the mobile telephone fee and the creation of a digital agency. It is good to promote the political agendas which are close to Japanese people's everybody's life and the efficiency of government. But I would like to expect Mr. Suga would be vocal on more global agenda as well. He announced that Japan will achieve zero carbon emission by 2015. I think it is a very good step, but what I expect him is not promoting certain type of ideology nor nationalism, but pursuing practical and effective approach for goals of big picture in the United States or other, with other democratic countries. Third keyword is diversity. I'm sure that next, next Biden's cabinet and White House administration will be very diversity with lots of women, people with color and the young generation. So it is already announced, announced in the United States that next United Nations ambassador would be African American women, first Hispanic Homeland Security Secretary. It is also announced the Treasury Secretary and the top of intelligence agency are going to women as well. I'm feeling a little bit nervous when I imagine 
US Japan ministerial meeting with full of old men with black suits in Japanese side and very diverse members in US counterpart side. Of course, racial demographic is not the same between US and Japan. However, it's time for Japan to change our mindset and to highly value the diversity and making efforts to have more women and younger generation in our politics. Uh, lastly, it is needless to say that Japan should be always very democratic and have better relationship with the neighboring Asian nation. So it was not bad that Prime Minister Suga picked up the Vietnam and the Indonesia to Asian nation for first official visit. But as a democratic regional leader, Japan should make far more great efforts to normalize the relationship with those neighboring countries, which is South Korea. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sawamura. Uh, very uh, comprehensive presentation. It is very interesting about that. And especially you uh, stressed about the uh, diversity of Biden government. Um, perhaps it might be better, we'd like to uh, uh, divide each person's uh, presentation. After the, uh, each person's presentation, uh, we'd like to ask a question and answer. If you have a, a short question, a one or two person, please shake your hand or write in a question and answer. Is it possible? Um, I also asked yesterday to uh, Mr. Graham Fukushima, um, Biden uh, was get a half of the American citizens vote. So that's why he's a little compromise with the uh, uh, um, Republican Party as well. And if they uh, do some compromise uh, about the diplomacy uh, toward the East Asian uh, politics or Japanese politics, um, how is it possible to uh, consider uh, Biden's diplomatic policy in Japan and East Asia? Is it the more moderate uh, policy will be happen, or it might be a continue the same policy now in the United States of America. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> that's a good question. I think the uh, I don't think the uh, for example uh, the, the the American foreign policy with regard to like I said, China is not is not going to, to change so much. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but also we have to keep in mind that the most biggest priority is the, the for Biden is the more the uh, domestic issues. And that means the uh, how to get out of the crisis of the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And also the, uh, not the from the, uh, the uh, compromising with the Republican party, it, it could happen also because the, now we have to wait the result of the, uh, none of election in Georgia, it really decided what kind of direction the, uh, the Biden administration is going, mm -hmm. because if the, uh, they, he, he will not be able to get to control the, uh, up the, the Senate, it's quite difficult to pursue their agendas. But also the Biden administration is also from the pressurized from the uh, progressive factor in, in Democratic parties. So the tourist is not happy about the uh, spending so much on uh, like military expenses. Mm -hmm. So I think the uh, the Biden will be more pursuing like the not increasing military influence, but more like emphasize on the rule making, mm -hmm. and then more the body oriented approach. I think. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, is there any other question? Um, he spoke much about the China. So, is there any question from Professor Jin Du? 
Professor Du from Takshoku University. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Then uh, I will, you know, the uh, well uh, and touch upon some things in my presentation. Okay, it, okay. it's okay for me now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So after that, um, who will ask something? Uh, Mr. Professor Ogawa, do you have any question about seeing from the Japanese politics or European politics? Um, let well, could I have some, a couple of minutes? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> hmm. Well, Professor Ken Ishida. Yes. Um, I raise one question that um, the um, for just management to uh, take care of the COVID. Um, the, uh, you said that the populism was unsuccessful to cope with this uh, situation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time that the Chinese government was rather successful to manage to uh, just deal with uh, COVID. And uh, how one could just differentiate that populism and authoritarian type of government. And uh, if you think that the uh, populism was not so successful, but it does not necessary that the uh, democratic regime could make success rather than uh, authoritarian regime. And how do you think about these uh, situations? Okay, thank you. Good, very good question. It's a huge good question, I think. And then uh, I would say this populism government, populist leader is not able to ask their population a hardship, uh, which is, I mean, for example, like the, the Mr. Donald Trump, he is very reluctant to talk about wearing the mask because there are many American people who who, do not, who doesn't like the wearing the mask. Mm -hmm. Talking about the, the we sh we should be keeping our freedom, our freedom will not be interfered by the uh, the authorities. So uh, that's why the, uh, the Mr. Trump is very, very reluctant to talk about the uh, hard policies, hard ball, playing hardball against the, 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 with regard to the prevention of the COVID-19. So in that sense, I think the, uh, the, uh, the populist leader is not so or good at the uh, the uh, containing the, the doing the making the uh, crisis management in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different from the China situation. China is more authoritarian state, authoritarian country, and also there are other authoritarian states. Uh, I think the the Trump administration administration is not authoritarian. It's really populist countries because the uh, they are very much against the uh, uh, putting the rules for individuals. But sometimes the uh, they are like always always talking about the nice conversation with to, to their core supporters. So it doesn't it doesn't make the, the successful outcome with regard to the solution to the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, perhaps uh, uh, neoliberalism is more fit for the COVID-19. COVID-19 inf infected more, much more in a liberal society in you know, the United States of Europe or Europe. And uh, authoritarian country like uh, China, 
or something like Hong Kong or Taiwan as well, it is easy to oppress the COVID-19. So it might be very interesting to consider politically uh, the uh, infection of the COVID-19. Okay, thank you very much. Time is over. So it is really very interesting uh, presentation about the American presidential election and uh, the new world order in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Kawam uh, Sawamura. Thank you very much. Very interesting, thank you. So next uh, about uh, United Kingdom, uh, Professor Kibata, uh, Emeritus Professor of Tokyo University. Thank you, floor is yours. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I hear you. So, so I want to share my, I want to show my PowerPoint. Okay, my name is Yoichi Kibata, and um, at first I uh, thank and congratulate both Professor Haba and Professor Mizobata uh, for convening this symposium uh, during such a very such a difficult period. Um, uh, two weeks ago, I saw a newspaper article. Uh, about a statement made by the British Prime, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Uh, in that statement, Johnson said, I quote, next year, uh, Her Majesty's ship, Queen Elizabeth, did a British and Allied task group on our most ambitious deployment for two, two decades, encompass encompassing the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and East Asia, unquote. And in addition to career deployment, Johnson announced the creation of a national cyber force and a space command. I felt that the creation of a cyber force might be justified under the current circumstances, but the deployment of an aircraft in ocean and East Asia could not be, cannot be rationally explained. However, on further reflection, that is considering uh, my argument in today's speech, uh, the British government's idea may not be so strange. And so let me turn to my speech. Uh, as you know, uh, Britain had a referendum about its EU, EU membership in June uh, 2016. And as a result of it, uh, Britain left the EU in January and is now at the uh, very last stage of negotiating with the EU, EU about their new relationship. In my speech, I want to deal with one important factor that lay behind the victory of the Leave vote in the referendum. The result of the referendum gave me a great shock. My career as a historian falls into roughly the same period as the period of ship of EC and EU. I first stayed in Britain between 1968 and 69, when Britain was not yet a member of the EC, but when I stayed there for the second time uh, from 1975 to 76, uh, Britain was already a member country and uh, it entered the EC in 73. And in 1975, in London, I watched the first referendum uh, and since then, I have been engaged in the research about various phases and aspects of the breakup of the British Empire and have always emphasized the importance of transformation of Britain's position in the world from an imperial power uh, to a European country. In arguing, that, in arguing that Britain should accelerate that sort of transformation and become more attached to European integration, I always thought that Japan had a problem in its relations with neighboring Asian countries. And so, uh, of course, in the case of East Asia, uh, regional integration had not yet materialized. 
Now, in short, my argument was, as Britain should become more a part of Europe, Japan should become more a part of Asia. And so I was uh, much dissatisfied and disappointed uh, with the result of the referendum. And the reasons for the vote in the referendum are various, and this is not a place to discuss those. Uh, but here, I would like to uh, point out that one important factor uh, was what we can, can be called an imperial nostalgia. That is a feeling that Britain should not be content with being only a part of integrated Europe, and Britain should seek again uh, for a more important position uh, in the world at large. That is, used to enjoy before. Uh, during the period uh, leading up to the uh, referendum, there were voices expressing this kind of imperial uh, nostalgia. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in 20, uh, 2015, the Institute of Economic Affairs, a pro-Brexit organization, uh, published a report, Directions for Britain Outside the EU, which content pursue a free trade through the route of Commonwealth and the Anglosphere. Of course, it is uh, impossible to decide how important this kind of sentiment was uh, for the victory uh, of the Leave side in the referendum. But it is, I think, easy to refute the validity of such a proposal. At the time when this proposal was, was made, the biggest trade partner of Britain was, of course, the EU and the key country in the so-called Anglosphere, that is the United States of America, was a second partner with far less share of British trade. The attitude which sought the future prospect of Britain outside the EU in the renewed close relationship with the USA and the Commonwealth countries was nothing but an imperial nostalgia. A few days after the referendum, Professor Philip Levine, a prominent American historian of the British Empire, wrote a short Brexit succeeded by playing to Britain's imperious nostalgia and stressed, I quote, Britain's long association with imperialism was a major undercurrent in the campaign to leave the EU, unquote. After the referendum, the persistence of imperial nostalgia became more evident. And words like Kanzak, Anglosphere, or Empire 2.0, they began to be heard in public. And these are, of course, terms that strongly remind us of the British Empire. In the case of Anglosphere and Empire 2.0, uh, I think no explanation is necessary. Uh, Kanzak is a word. Uh, which combines Sea of Canada uh, with ANZAC. ANZAC uh, stands for the military collaboration between Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, people who used these words, these words uh, hope that Britain, uh, which was once the center of great empire and hub of the English speaking sphere, would regain that sort of position outside the EU. Uh, Boris Johnson himself is one of uh, supporters of such an idea. Uh, for example, in 2017, uh, 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 Johnson, the then foreign minister, wrote that after leaving the EU, the UK, I quote, uh, will be able to get great deals, not least with the fastest growing commerce economies and build truly global Britain. Unquote. And here it should be pointed out that this term global Britain has been very widely used in various quarters since the referendum. Imperial nostalgia is an outdated sentiment and the future direction of Britain, which it entails is completely unrealistic in my view. But in order to say, so in order to say so, back upon the history of the world in the 20th century, 
and Britain's position in that world. Uh, here, the 20th century means what I call as the long 20th century. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that is from the 1870s uh, to the early 1990s, from the beginning of the age of imperialism uh, to the uh, end of the Cold War. Uh, after the 1870s, colonization of Africa gained momentum, the world became roughly divided uh, into those countries which ruled the colonies and those areas which were ruled. And uh, what I call imperialist world system uh, took shape. The theme of this symposium is 100 years of world wars and post-war regional collaboration and good governance. Uh, talking about regional collaboration, uh, regional frameworks in this imperialist world are mostly defined by the ruling imperial powers uh, and the scope of regional collaboration was limited. And as for governance, uh, the colonial governance, which is based on asymmetrical and unequal uh, colonial rule was prevalent. Uh, this imperialist world system was transformed by two world wars. Uh, the First World War uh, did not change, in my view, this system radical breakup did start as a result of the war, of that war. That process, that is the process of decolonization was accelerated by the Second World War and finally led to the collapse of the imperialist world system. The early 1990s, which saw the end of the Cold War, uh, was the final phase of this process. In this view, the breakup of the East, Eastern Euro European Socialist Bloc meant at the same time the collapse of the Soviet imperialism. In this process, regional collaboration began to be propelled by the newly independent countries. In Southeast Asia, the ASEAN was created in 1967 by five countries, uh, of which only Thailand had not experienced colonial rule. In Africa, uh, the OAU, Organization of African Unity, was launched in 1963 by 32 African countries, most of which had become independent only shortly. Before. In this process, outright colonial governance faded away, and various forms of international governance, which was based on the exercise of sovereignty acquired by former colonies, came to dominate the world stage, however incomplete complete that sovereignty might be. Uh, Britain occupied a very important uh, position in the world of the long 20th century, especially during the early phase. It is said that Britain ruled one and the population, population. As a hegemonic power, Britain could lay down various international standards and norms. It was regarded as the front runner of the world of civilization. Now having what I call a imperial mindset or imperial mentality, take up Ishiki in Japanese, British people regarded Britain's ruling positions as natural, and even if their concrete knowledge very poor or hazy, they had little or no doubt about the imperial structure which surrounded their daily life. In fighting both world wars, Britain depended very much on material and the human resources of various parts of empire. I have been calling this situation figuratively the total war of the empire. As a result of these total wars, Britain did become one of the victorious powers. But at the same time, these total wars prepared the way it was a decolonization and the collapse of the empire. For this reason, as there have been people uh, who thought that Britain should not have fought these world wars in order to keep the British Empire and preserve its power. For example, Neil Ferguson, who later became well known for the advocacy of the merit of the British Empire, argued in a book published in 1998 as follows. 
uh, for a matter of weeks, continental Europe could have been transformed into something not wholly unlike the European Union today, today is 1998. But without a massive contraction in British overseas power entailed by the fighting of two world wars. But Britain did fight these wars. And despite the effort to stem the tide of decolonization, the precious process of the, uh, breaking up the empire became uh, irrevocably underway. Uh, in 1962, Dean Atchison, former United States Secretary of State, made a famous statement, Great Britain has lost an empire, but not found a role. One year before, in 1961, the British government had applied for the membership of the EEC, which had been founded three years before, in 1958. This application and the second application made in 1967 was rejected, but finally Britain could become a member. As Atchison's statement suggested, Britain's international behavior around this period was largely defined by the process of decolonization, and it was hoped that Britain, which had lost an empire, could and would find a new role as a European country in integrated Europe. What should be noted here is that European integration itself took place against the background of decolonization and this theme was uh, discussed, uh, I was dealt with in a session. Uh, as I wrote before, in the wake of decolonization, regional collaboration started to be undertaken by newly independent countries. But in the case of Western Europe, a regional collaboration and integration was propelled by countries which were a ruling powers in imperialist world system. Among uh, uh, the, the initial six members, uh, uh, which were uh, founding members of the EEC, four countries, except Germany, possessed colonies at the time of its foundation. Uh, so the, uh, therefore, I think in the structure of the EEC and the EEC, which was launched in 67, a certain continuity from the imperialist world system could be detected. Still, Britain's entry into the EC meant a great leap from the situation in which Britain played a significant international role as a center of a huge empire. Uh, since it joined the EC, Britain had often been called an awkward partner in integrated Europe, and it continued uh, to keep distance from any initiative, initiative to deepen integration. Uh, that attitude was epitomized in Margaret Thatcher's crying out, no, 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 uh, in the parliament in 1990 against the European Commission's attempt to deepen its function. I was in Britain in London at the time and was much impressed uh, by Thatcher's you know, crying on TV. Uh, Thatcher had to resign from premiership immediately after that. Uh, uh, the period of her premiership uh, that lasted from 1979 to 1990 also saw the lingering of imperial mindset. The mindset clearly surfaced during the Falklands War in 1982. Uh, this kind of lingering imperial mindset has been carried over into the 21st century of imperial nostalgia and influenced the outcome of the referendum in 1916. In 2017, a book titled uh, Inglorious Empire, uh, What the British Did to India, uh, written by Shashi Tarur, uh, an Indian politician and author, uh, was published in Britain. Uh, that book was um, originally published in India one year before uh, with the title of Darkness, the British Empire, India. Uh, uh, that book uh, is it, a very critical historical examination of British rule in India. The author argues, I quote, Britain is no longer such right, though in the aftermath of the Brexit, it may even be worse. The need to temper British imperial nostalgia with post-colonial responsibility 
has never been greater. And certainly, imperial strength, imperial mindset, which resurfaced a long time after the collapse of the imperialist world system, should be erased in looking for a balanced position of Britain in the world today. But it is a big question whether Britain, which is now led by pursuer of imperial after image, like Boris Johnson, uh, can find a correct way uh, in a multipolarizing world. As a historian, uh, I have been with Britain, I must say, but I want to continue to watch the way Britain is heading for. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kibata. It is very, very interesting about the imperialistic thought of the UK, Great Britain. Um, I'd like to ask two questions. Uh, one is a very short question about the Brexit. Uh, after the Brexit, uh, economically, uh, United Kingdom is a little difficult to uh, pursue their um, trade uh, with other countries because the tax between uh, UK and the EU started uh, a little higher. Uh, so uh, how do you think uh, to solve this uh, situation? The second is a little more complicated. Uh, you also mentioned about the Falkland uh, incident uh, about uh, the Hong Kong incident. Uh, I think uh, UK uh, behavior is something a little uh, imperialistic uh, thought which you said, because uh, uh, when the Falkland independence movement, uh, UK started to make a war against the Falkland, but about the Hong Kong uh, movement of independence, uh, he wished to uh, support the Hong Kong movement. So therefore, generally speaking, uh, Chinese um, behavior using the law uh, of the state security, uh, maintaining the state security might be possible to use by uh, Europe or United Kingdom or uh, US as well. But uh, in this time, it is a controversy. Uh, generally speaking, uh, China used the rule of law and uh, UK and the US is criticized about a Chinese um, behavior. So how do you think about the Hong Kong incident? Uh, seeing from the UK. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. We had two very important, difficult questions. And, and the, about the first question, the uh, trade and the economic relations which Britain uh, is going to pursue in, uh, after the Brexit. Well, the, the thing hasn't been said yet. Uh, as I said, the, uh, the negotiation with the EU is uh, at the, the last stage, but but nobody can know. I mean, the, uh, there might be a situation in which no deal, you know, uh, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no new agreement will be uh, concluded. Might be uh, not be already concluded. That that kind may happen. You know, that sort of uh, situation may happen, and. So the, uh, and I think the, uh, this uh, uh, new uh, relations, new agreement with the EU uh, uh, might be our sort of kind of starting point of the uh, of Britain's uh, future path. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so we have to uh, uh, watch. And uh, about the second question, uh, and the, the uh, people in Falkland didn't uh, want independence. I mean, the Ar Argentine, they did want to take back Falklands Islands, Malvinas Islands, what, uh, in their uh, parlance. And then, uh, but in the, in the case of Hong Kong, I, as you say, you know, there is the uh, movement to to, to uh, uh, seek 
for a kind of independence in, 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 uh, for Hong Kong. But, and a British attitude, I think, uh, reflects a kind of you know, uh, sense of responsibility uh, mm -hmm. for the uh, Hong Kong people. And um, uh, the Hong Kong uh, uh, was in the British Empire for uh, uh, one and a half a century. And um, uh, uh, imperial sort of legacy uh, 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 is um, uh, very deeply you know, imprinted uh, on the, in Hong Kong. And um, uh, so the, uh, the British attitude towards Hong Kong has um, uh, also uh, a kind of you know, a, a strong legacy uh, which they inherit from the, the, the days uh, uh, during which the uh, Britain ruled Hong Kong. And um, so the uh, uh, so that's the reason why the uh, there is a very strong you know, sympathy towards the, uh, 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 the voice of the Hong Kong people, but you know the uh, uh, the the history of British rule you know Hong Kong cannot be erased from history, and uh, uh, so. The, uh, uh, it, it, it is creating a sort of very delicate, you know, problem situation. So this is my brief answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, it is really very interesting uh, presentation, and this especially uh, imperialistic thought uh, continue until now is. Uh, so much important, uh, perhaps not only the UK, but also um, Europe or uh, United States as well. Thank you very much uh, for your excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'd like to change the chair to uh, Professor Mizobata and uh, continue the Professor uh, Jin Du and uh, Mr. Klaus Witt. Thank you very much. Professor Mizobata, thank you. Uh, who is the first one? Uh, to, uh, Jindu, uh, Professor. Yes, uh, to, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Jindu, uh, past president of the Chinese uh, Professors Association. Uh, would you please make a presentation? Just okay. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, invite me. And I will share my. Let me see. It is okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. okay, I can see you. Let me see. Oh, it didn't move. Okay. Yes. Okay, let me uh, try to. Okay. Oh, now let's begin. The, uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me first uh, very briefly introduce myself. My name is Jin Du, and uh, I'm teaching economics and international relations in Takushiku University in Japan. But at the same time, I have some uh, visiting positions in China and in the other part of it, including the United States. And uh, my background is a development economist. So I actually, during my uh, the more than three decades of career, I've been involved in the, uh, some international development projects of the World Bank, as well as Japanese ODA project in mm -hmm. China. So that's why, you know, the year I have, uh, you know, kept of cruise watch the uh, the BRI, the uh, Baden Road Initiative, uh, you know, the since the Chinese government announced these initiations. So last year, in the year, during the period of the second Belt and the Road Initiative sub summit meeting that was, uh, you know, held in the Beijing, I was there. 
So I had a very good chance to talk to the think tank people and uh, to the local government and also to the business people and uh, some others. So this experience gave me a very good, you know, experience, you know, the uh, understanding uh, what's uh, going on and uh, actually I have changed my view uh, on this issue. So when uh, Professor Haba uh, invited me very kindly uh, to uh, talk uh, to this very distinguished uh, the audience, I was uh, very grateful and uh, I uh, very appreciate this opportunity to share my view uh, on the BRA. But of course, you know, my, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk is uh, completely uh, my personal view and uh, uh, I have no any, you know, relations, linkages or represents the, uh, the officials, the positions of the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, uh, my uh, talk was structured as uh, the following. First of all, I will talk very briefly uh, the, what the BRA is, BIR is, and then I will you know, the, uh, draw some the points of the uh, com uh, <coughs> controversies around the, the, the BRA. And then, you know, according to my personal understanding, I will try to, you know, review uh, the important re in the development and also the challenges. And then uh, finally, uh, I, my personal uh, the, uh, view is the BRA, they have to change and shift it to uh, the so-called BRA 2.0. So let's uh, begin uh, from what the uh, BRA is. You know, the uh, China's BR Baton and the Road Initiative first announced by uh, President Xi Jinping in 2013. That's a one bed, one road. And uh, this is a massive, you know, the global development project and it will include the, uh, more than 70 the countries by the land and also by the sea. So very uh, <clears throat> ambitious and a big program. And also, you know, try to coordinate the policy making across the uh, Eurasia and Eastern Africa. So, uh, by the end of uh, 2019, uh, 135 countries and 30 international organizations have signed BRA cooperation documents with China. So this is really a big project. And if you look at this map, you can see this is uh, Chinese initiatives to provide some international the uh, public goods for the world and uh, to build it together with the people all over the world and uh, to promote the uh, world e economic development. But if you look at this, look at this map, this is uh, what's really going on and under construction. Uh, it includes six corridors, but you know, just give you some image you uh, perhaps you can judge from this the uh, map that uh, it's really a kind of uh, China centric, right? Uh, China tried to expand uh, its uh, in, uh, economic uh, the, uh, uh, the influence uh, uh, the, uh, uh, up to the Western and also to the, the, the South. So no doubt the, the BRA, uh, they uh, <coughs> invited a lot of uh, controversies. I myself uh, tend to consider uh, this initiative is a quite a mixed one. And I agree with the uh, judgment of the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, 
you know, an article in uh, the Economist in uh, 2018. And it says, you know, China's bed and the road plans are to be welcomed by a lot of a country. And at, at the same time, uh, to be worried about a lot of a concerns about that. So I think the, uh, for most uh, the countries, you know, they saw this Chinese initiatives as a big economic development opportunities. They welcomed that, but uh, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, analysts and uh, also the policy makers, they saw this basically through the reins of uh, geographic strategies. And uh, also I think the year, uh, perhaps you all know about the uh, uh, recently the, the criticism about the Chinese bed and road initiatives. And for example, the Chinese back the railway uh, projects in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand has a stalled. And uh, the local governments, they have complained about the excess costs and the corruptions. And uh, also the, uh, the former Malaysia prime minister, uh, the Mahathir is a very outspoken politician. And uh, he even named the Chinese uh, the uh, BRA initiatives at the new type, <coughs> the uh, colonism. So I think the uh, uh, analysis have uh, uh, criticized Beijing uh, for uh, practicing the so-called, uh, you know, they did trap uh, the uh, uh, diplomacy. That is to say, the using BRA as a cover to extend uh, the loans that will leave its partners behold on China's interests. And of course, the American the diplomacy under the Trump administrations, they routinely uh, they criticize Beijing as so a predatory landing. And uh, I think the, uh, perhaps you all know, the US Secretary of State, Michael Pompeo, they refer to the BRA as a Chinese attempt to buy an empire. So, a lot of uh, criticisms. And uh, I think that the, uh, perhaps I am going to you know, explain the Chinese vision in my own uh, you know, perspectives. A lot of have been written on these topics, but I think that the best way is quote the leader, uh, the Chinese leader, Xi Jinping. And uh, actually uh, he is a founder of this approach uh, the uh, 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 initiations. Uh, Xi Jinping made a uh, keynote speech at the first BRI summit meeting in uh, 2017. I quote, uh, he said, this is the project of the century, right? And uh, he said, this is the, uh, what we are hope to create is a big family of uh, harmonious coexistence. So a lot of people, they, uh, they think about well, what, what does this uh, really mean? You know, the uh, BRA is anything but, you know, the uh, harmonious, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, in his speech, actually uh, the BRA included nearly everything from the infrastructure, transportation, trade, finance, and also stability and innovation and people-to-people uh, -people connectivity, so on and so forth. Well, but after two years, you know, China holds the uh, second BRA summit meeting. And uh, the uh, uh, President Xi Jinping called on the participants actually are from, I, th I think the, uh, the delegations from 150 uh, countries. 
and he called on the participants to continue to advance the initiative along the path of a high quality development. And I think here's the point. And uh, he said that the principle of a co uh, extensive consultation, joint contribution, and the shared benefits should be uphold. This is okay, right? And uh, I think the, uh, he emphasis on the uh, openness and the green and the clean. The green is, uh, you know, environmental friendly and the clean is uh, free of uh, cooperation. So he said, well, the open transparent, the open, the clean, the clean approaches should be adhered to. This is, I think, this is a new development. And uh, the goal of a high standard, the livelihood improving and a sustainable development should be achieved. So I think there are some, you know, the uh, major uh, changes uh, in, in his vision. And uh, I think in 2018, when the BRA, you know, uh, the uh, <coughs> actually facing its uh, fifth year of uh, fifth the anniversaries, she attended a symposium and uh, he made a speech and he used the analog from Chinese painting, the Guohua, uh, as a switching from Xie Yi. Xie Yi is mean the, you know, the, the painting for outlining very broad strokes. And he said now the project was uh, shifting from Xie Yi to Gongbi. Gongbi is for very carefully uh, the uh, uh, inscriptions of the, uh, the details. So now details most important. And also the devil is in the detail as uh, you know, the uh, English speaking nations are always, you know, reporting. <laughs> and uh, I found two new key words in his speech. That is uh, priority. It's not about everything, perhaps it's not everything, but you have to put something first. You have to have the list to, you know, uh, make uh, a year, you know, the priorities. And also he uh, stressed on the execution. Not only, you know, speak about the vision, but the feasibility and uh, the possibility for uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the people to implement it. So what that is this shift means, I think the, uh, the Chinese government has never provided the official definition of what constitutes a BRA project. And also it did not, you know, uh, China, uh, has not issued a list of approved BRA participants that actually caused a lot of uh, confusions and uh, you know a lot of uh, the people from the uh, local government from private and uh, state owned companies they went to the countries and they said well our project is a uh, part of the bra and uh, you know uh, <clears throat> the the host countries cannot judge for uh, for, for for the things then you know, a lot of uh, the uh, misconductions and a lot of uh, the uh, confusions uh, have, you know, uh, witnesses or taken place. So this is really contributed to the confusion, misconducts, and, uh, you know, invited a lot of uh, criticism and setbacks. So now, actually, the BIA needs a uh, fundamental reforms, I think this is newly uh, the, uh, for, uh, the, the, the uh, formed the consensus of the Chinese leadership. So why is that? So I think the, you know, this is actually the seven years of uh, the beginning of the BRA. 
and the, the BIA is supposed to be a century long, you know, projects. So at the beginning, I think this is natural, you know, for Chinese government, you know, the, uh, to, to do something, you know, according to its domestic traditions. And many observers out of China assume that that because China is a autocracy, is led by a one party, it's a one party state led by a very strong uh, centralized the government. And uh, its leader, you know, formulate very far sighted uh, the ground strategy and uh, which subordinates work uh, to faithful <coughs> execute. But the reality shows that this is not the case. Perhaps the opposite is true, right? So we need to understand the nature of the Chinese domestic policy making mechanisms. So what's the Chinese uh, the domestic policy make, uh, making uh, the, uh, uh, mechanisms? Uh, I call it uh, the policy campaign. That is to say, the top leaders uh, mobilizing the uh, bureaucrats, entrepreneurs, and uh, sometimes even the ordinary people towards a single vision. It's a very big vision. And then uh, because of lacking of uh, the policy framework to coordinate efforts of the mass scale and the high speed you know, projects like this, the campaign usually produce huge mistakes. The when problems grow too serious to ignore, the leadership is forced to adjust. So I think the year we have experienced, uh, had witnesses a lot of uh, the year policies, uh, Chinese domestic policies uh, of uh, this circle. And uh, the BIA has showcased the, the typical pattern of uh, the campaign politics. Uh, that is the first to show a vision, vision setting, and uh, then to demobilize the mass, mass mobilization. And, uh, you know, the, uh, when the serious problems appeared, then the, uh, to do some sub subsequent recalibration. But, you know, the, according to my uh, judgment, the uh, BRA is here to stay. It will not disappear. It's uh, so huge. And uh, China will push on advancing the BRA. This is because of uh, China has a huge economic interest in it. So uh, I think the year uh, uh, to observe some uh, uh, over capacities, especially in steel and some equipments, and uh, also to promote the economic development in China's less developed the middle and the Western areas. And also, you know, uh, to, uh, to encourage Chinese business to go out and also to secure its energy supply, the in, in the import of the energy, the oil and the natural gas, uh, and so on and so forth. A lot of interest in that. And uh, uh, this is actually the most important part of Chinese the diplomacy, uh, so ground the world strategy. And uh, I think the uh, perhaps the most important thing, now the BRA initiative actually was uh, written into the party constitution of Chinese Communist Party. So it becomes the Chinese political identity, right? So I think the, uh, this is huge, the uh, project, and uh, it will not be. And, uh, but because of so many problems and so many criticisms, so China has to make a very fundamental the reform and China needs collaborations, especially uh, China, you know, uh, actually the uh, uh, very actively considering to work with the international institutions 
for example, the World Bank and some other organizations, and uh, especially they're working with the advanced countries like uh, Japan, and if hopefully the United States and the European countries. So what's the implication for that? I think the, uh, well, the BRAs need to, uh, to reform fundamentally, but it will, you know, here's to stay for a long time. And it's a big project. It has a very positive side of it. Uh, so the international community has a very great stake in combining China's ambition and resources and with the needs of a global economic development. Uh, I think the, here I will say a few a word on the U, uh, US and China economic relations. You know, the uh, un, uh, United Gov uh, the Obama government actually is very skeptical on this, uh, the, uh, 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 <coughs> the in Chinese initiatives, but uh, Trump actually is quite a little bit different. Actually, he sent a White House team to uh, attend the first summit meeting in Beijing. But of course, just like uh, the Mr. Sawamura uh, has pointed out, the Trump, uh, Donald Trump, uh, the, the administration lack of a comprehensive, consistent, and effective strategy, and uh, he just want me to uh, 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 make a deal. And uh, his main consideration is about his uh, re-election. Uh, so he found, you know, the tough on China is good. So uh, I think in the late period of his administration, uh, the uh, Trump administration you know, strengthened its uh, criticism on the BRA. But uh, the uh, things, uh, the, uh, well, we will uh, the welcome or witness a new the US government and uh, the president elected Biden uh, will have uh, you know, different approaches uh, towards the international affairs, of course, he will concentrate on his domestic uh, the uh, things first. But I think this will open a window for the cooperation between China and the United States. This is very essential for the future development of the region and world economy. I think I will stop here and uh, welcome Kuritisun. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Jindu. Okay, so any questions and any comments are welcome. So, are there any points, questions? Yes, I think the presentation is very uh, comprehensive uh, investigation to the, uh, the road initiative. And finally, so uh, uh, Professor Jindu uh, arranged the uh, concept of uh, BRI to zero, okay. May I uh, ask some questions to you? Okay. okay. And uh, okay, so uh, one moment is uh, the impact of the uh, conflict between US and uh, China uh, trade wars. I mean, uh, should be the situation become deteriorating from the viewpoint of the, so Beijing. So, are there any so serious has an impact to the content of BRI uh, from the angle of the, the, such a trade war between uh, China and um, America? And in addition, after the so COVID nineteen, uh, are there any has a change or are there any has uh, has impact to the in, in content to of the BRI in practice? It's my question. Okay, I think they are very good question. And uh, the VRA is really about the connectivity and uh, COVID-19 actually prevented people 
from moving <laughs> with each other. So this is a big question. But uh, uh, some people argue, you know, this gives a very good opportunity for China to, you know, uh, the export its uh, information, you know, the technology. So uh, the so-called the uh, digital uh, Baton Road Initiative has mm -hmm. been in the. So this actually uh, invited the, the, uh, the criticism from the United States because they think you, know, you know, the uh, China is seeking for the uh, uh, dominance in the high tech. And they are worried about the information and some others. So I think the, well, uh, the United States and uh, China have to figure out what's the, uh, uh, the field uh, the, the, the two countries can cooperate and uh, what's the uh, really, you know, the, uh, the things uh, related to the security and, uh, you know, they try to figure out. And, uh, uh, from my understanding, now Chinese government is uh, preparing for three lists. The first list is about the, you know, uh, the, what kind of the projects uh, the uh, China and the United States can, uh, you know, cooperate. And uh, the second is about the dialogue mechanism. The, mm -hmm. You know, you, uh, United States and China has a lot of. Uh, the uh, dialogue mechanism, but it stopped after uh, Trump take over uh, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the power. But uh, uh, China tried to restore the, uh, uh, these mechanisms. And uh, three, uh, the third one is about the, uh, the crisis management lists. Mm -hmm. What kind of the, uh, the issues, you know, uh, we should you know, avoid to become the source of uh, com conflicts. I think the, the Chinese government have prepared for something, you know, try to find a way to, you know, deal with the, the United States more in a more the, uh, constructive way. I think the, uh, I have, this is my, my, my take on it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any, any other questions? How is this other question? Is okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jindu. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And how is this? <laughs> Sorry, next speaker. Yes. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So from German Embassy, uh, Minister uh, Klaus Witze. Thank you very much, Klaus Witze. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Klaus Fietze. Um, I am the deputy now in the German embassy in Tokyo. But in uh, my uh, previous uh, postings, I have been dealing with Japan, with Korea, with uh, China for six years. And I have also been working on nuclear disarmament in Vienna. Mm -hmm. So that uh, First, I would like to um, uh, thank uh, Professor Mizubata, Professor Haba, and the other organizers for convening this conference. Um, I have to give the usual disclaimer, so I'm not, uh, I'm giving you today my personal opinions. It's not uh, the opinion of the German government. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you very much for coming to conference. So, uh, with rising infection numbers all, all over the world, we need to stay vigilant. Therefore, these virtual formats have become kind of really useful to get to stay in touch with, with each other. So, we all know the pandemic is far from over, but we see some light at the end of the tunnel with uh, vaccines coming up. So Professor Haber uh, mentioned um, that uh, some of the more authoritarian countries were more successful in dealing with the COVID crisis. Uh, they will be very ho happy to hear that, but uh, I think it's more a question 
that in general countries in East Asia were quite successful to deal with this crisis. So that will be a matter for scientists in the future to figure out uh, why that was like this. And also I would like to, to uh, draw your attention to the fact that one of the most free and open democracies, New Zealand, was the most successful in dealing with the crisis, so don't, let's not forget that as well. And uh, well, uh, to be authoritarian and to have the power to, to command people in your country might have been helpful for dealing with the COVID crisis, but that doesn't mean that uh, the power to command and not to convince is, is a better society uh, system. And uh, well, we should not follow this conclusion, which is very convenient for some countries, but it's just, um, just one side of the medal. Right. Uh, well, uh, no country can uh, win this fight against the pandemic alone, and uh, no country can secure its economic prosperity and its peaceful development uh, on its own. So in general, we uh, need to join forces and we cannot cooperate effectively without well-functioning multilateral systems. In this series, and this spirit, we have already seen a number of initiatives worldwide to build back better. To build back better the multilateral systems after Corona and also after Trump. I think this idea is uh, common sense, especially for the Japanese people, uh, coming from many uh, historical experiences in recovering from disaster and this kind of uh, essential part of Japanese mentality. There I, therefore, I hope that especially Japan will be a natural partner in these efforts to, to build back uh, af after this, uh, this crisis. Uh, build back better today uh, reaches far beyond the current pan epidemic. We have to continue to build a better world order based on fairness, balance of interests and a forward-looking approach to the imminent problems we are facing together. Uh, President-elect Biden has also used the slogan Build Back Better in his election campaign. He wrote in Foreign Affairs already in March that first and foremost we must repair and reinvigorate our own democracy even as we strengthen the coalition of democracies that stand without around the world. If this becomes one core idea of the Biden administration, the US could uh, again play a leadership role in rebuilding international order. Um, we all know leadership needs uh, power, capability, but it all also needs a high degree of acceptance and uh, legitimacy. It is always very difficult to find the right balance between these two sides of leadership. I think it goes back to Confucius and, and the Chinese uh, philosophy. Uh, he already thought about these two sides of, of leadership. For many years, the US were at the core of the multilateral systems, not only because of its sheer power, but also because of its vision, its overall successful society, and also because of the perceptions of shared values by its partners. So it was for many people quite painful to see the demolition of these values during the last four years. During the last four years, other countries, among them also my home country, Germany, have tried to preserve and to strengthen international order. We did this uh, with our best intentions and our initiatives and our goodwill will last and our contributions have also encouraged others. For instance, here in Japan. And we hope that uh, all those countries will continue to cooperate for the greater good. Together with, partner, together with partners, we have worked especially hard to achieve progress on, so, on some, some international crisis scenarios like in Yemen, Libya or Sahel. 
and for some, but for some global issues, we simply could not develop the necessary leverage to be really successful. We have learned that in order to maintain and to improve the multilateral systems, especially when it comes to the UN system, progress is extremely difficult without the leverage and capabilities of a determined US in the background. This is especially true for the conflict solving and conflict prevention mechanisms of the UN Security Council. It was also sh shocking to see how quickly the arms control mechanisms deteriorated, or at least lost momentum during the last years, including the nuclear arms control mechanisms. The INF Treaty was, for instance, one of the most important factors for security in Europe and it is gone. Um, ladies and gentlemen, especially on peace and security, we need the US, China and Russia to change directions completely and get back to the negotiation tables. This was possible during the Cold War. Why shouldn't that be possible today? Here in Asia, the problems are imminent. An arms race is in full swing and it is an arms race of the 21st century. Arms control and conflict prevention mechanisms have not been successful so far, and nobody seems to be ready to take the lead. It is not only the confrontation between the US and China, Professor Savamura mentioned. Here in Asia, uh, territorial issues have not been solved since World War II, and they are declared non-negotiable by all sides. This situation reminds me of Europe in the 60s. And maybe it even calls for a conference like we had in Helsinki in 1973, a conference that confirmed all borders in Europe and set also up the conflict-solving mechanisms of what is now the OSCE. Helsinki was only possible after almost 20 years of patient preparations by diplomats. It was possible when both sides of the Cold War were facing mutual destructions. Let's shortly remember the Cuba missile crisis, which this also fell into that time. It was also only possible because we had, uh, for a certain point in time, outstanding and very courageous leadership on both sides. What could be an out the outcome of such a conference? Maybe an acceptance of the rulings of the UN Court of the Law of the Sea by all parties involved, by all parties, parties involved concerning all territorial issues in East Asia. Such a mechanism did not even exist in 19, uh, 1973, and still in, in Europe it was managed to solve uh, the territorial issues. There had to be compensations and agreements about joint, joint exploitation of resources. But we understood then that everything is better than the nationalistic political priorities who can cause severe conflict scenarios, scenarios, and we all know that such scenarios in East Asia are already on the horizon. We should be more aware that even small conflicts can cause uh, a, an enormous level of disruption. Ladies and gentlemen, if America finds a way to repair, repair her democracy, to represent values, a well-functioning society, the rule of law, human rights and human dignity, economic success, and maybe even move into the direction of a comparatively fair social system, it might, may have a chance for leadership again. But this may very well be the last chance of this kind for of American leadership. 
Are there any countries who can take this role? I think, for instance, China can not fulfill a leadership role. For instance, because China does not even have one single like-minded partner. And it so far does not really show a fair approach to cooperation with partners. The Belt and Road experience, uh, Professor Jing Du uh, explained uh, very balanced, and I thank him for that, shows that even uh, regional hegemonial, hegemonial power is today very difficult to achieve for China. It will always be shaky, costly, and inefficient. If the balance between power and acceptance is disturbed, if partners only cooperate because there is no other choice, lasting and effective leadership is, in my view, not possible. Professor Jin Du said that the Belt and Road Initiative involves 70 countries. And uh, Xi Jinping in 2017 said that uh, this should be a big family of harmonic coexistence. Um, as he clearly mentioned, uh, that has not developed. And, and I'm really wondering uh, what influence the corona pandemic will have on the, on the whole uh, Belt and Road project. China might think sometimes that it can go its way alone and can do it by its unrivaled size and power but uh, the global repercussions to China's actions prove already different. I know uh, China has a high ability to learn, and maybe a Belt and Road Initiative 2.0 can really be more cooperative and less China-centric, but we have to see. Even uh, if China is now painting the Gung Bi, I think most of the other countries have not forgotten the here ye. So both have to be uh, resolved. Acceptance of leadership today means fair cooperation and mutual respect between partners. And the US uh, have a very good chance to regain uh, their position by working closely, first within a like-minded alliance, but also by setting the right goals and examples together with everybody who is ready to co cooperate on many issues, also with China. It all depends in the end on how we see the future of our societies, human rights, human dignity, the rule of law, and so on. These are all goals we try to achieve in, U achieve in Europe, and I must say we were quite successful in our efforts, despite all the remaining problems. There are and there have always been challenges to this consensus, even in Europe. It is still a very hard political challenge for political leaders to make the right decisions day by day. But uh, the long-term direction is clear. The long-term direction is in the EU treaties and is really widely accepted by most Europeans, being they member of the EU or not. We in Europe have understood after several, several terrible wars that we have to tackle the reason for conflict, like the territorial or economic questions. We agreed to give peace and prosperity a higher priority than to nationalistic pride and short-term domestic political gains. We also built mechanisms in Europe and beyond to solve problems peacefully. This is what we try to achieve, and in Europe we were quite successful so far, so far, knowing that we will always have to improve. To see the EU only as an economic entity fails completely to understand the fundamental fact that the EU was first of all a peace-preserving entity. Today the EU is much more than that, and we will make any effort in Europe to develop the EU further, to make it more effective for the challenges, challenges we are facing. Today, 
we need international cooperation more than ever. The COVID-19 pandemic is an obvious example for the many challenges we can only manage together. Climate change is another one, migration and globalization will continue and all of these problems need international governments and cooperation. These are all challenges without borders. We Europeans have to cooperate with very different partners, not only like-minded friends. We do need platforms to negotiate. We have to achieve one compromise after the other. We need to be resilient and tenacious, but we must be heading in the right direction. We need to repair and to build back better the multilateral systems together to achieve this kind of cooperation. That's why our own slogan uh, should be multilateralism first for the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Excellent presentation, uh, Minister Klaus Witt. And um, I also appreciate uh, the ambassador of German uh, embassy, uh, Ambassador Leffel. Uh, she came last week uh, to this uh, Aoyamagake University uh, International Conference Hall and I mm. explained about the International Conference and she recommended Minister Fitze is the best person mm. to have a presentation. So that's why I really appreciate uh, it is true and uh, mm. so interesting presentation. Yeah. Thank you for the virtual flowers. <laughs> Thank you. And now uh, we have one question from student in the floor. Can you read this one, uh, Megumi Taniguchi? Uh, it is interesting. The nature of Japanese and the German is similar uh, in some points. Uh, Mr. Klaus Witze, what do you think personally is a similar point between the Japan and German two nationalities or not? <laughs> Uh, first, I would question that there is something like a, a national character. Uh, maybe in a few points uh, our uh, systems uh, uh, educate people to uh, work hard, to follow goals and so on. But I would not say that it's a, a, a kind of a national character. I know too many people who are not in this way, <laughs> in Germany and in Japan. Yeah, but I, I think uh, there's a, a natural kind of natural sympathy between uh, German people and Japanese people. I cannot really explain this. But if you have uh, like 93% of Japanese people who have uh, stayed in Germany for a longer uh, time and still uh, really like our country, then there must be something. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's the other way around is uh, not similar, but uh, close. Mm -hmm. But that's certainly not true for many other countries. Mm. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Very good answer. Um, I also ask very short question. Um, uh, perhaps now it is said uh, G zero era, uh, mm. no G. Uh, mm. So the United States also um, unstable. Uh, China is a little hegemonic. But in my opinion, I respect the European Union very much and EU value or EU um, policy or strategy might be possible to lead the new world, uh, including German leadership. How do you think about that? Uh, I think uh, this um, we can only cooperate. Uh, the EU can certainly take a leadership role on some issues like uh, green uh, uh, energy, for instance also on a, on a, a fair uh, medical security system. We can have some topics where we can take the lead, go ahead and uh, pull others along with us. And uh, Japan has been very often a very cooperative partner 
if we started to do something like that. Yeah, but there are other issues that I said in my talk, especially the concerning uh, the, the larger uh, conflict prevention mechanisms where we really need the strong support of other partners as well. Yeah, the U.S. being the most important one, but uh, I think we also can have a good role in bringing other countries to negotiation tables yeah, to, to uh, be a very positive force for conflict solutions, like for instance we did in Iran, yeah, and to, to uh, also uh, be more involved in these kind of issues, uh, but never alone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so much multilateral collaboration is mm -hmm. most important in my future. Mm -hmm. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. So really, thank you very much all of the excellent speakers. And thank you very much for audiences as well to hearing very uh, endeavor uh, to come here. So we'd like to uh, close, but before that, I'd like to say three important information. One is this book. Uh, in this book is a proceeding book of 100 years of the world war and good governance. Uh, you can download this book articles from uh, Aoyamagaku University uh, Institute of uh, uh, for global international relations. So uh, if you wish, uh, please read this one. Uh, almost all articles is here, so you can download this one. And second is, uh, this is on demand. Uh, we are recording these all of the conference. So from uh, next um, Sunday, so three days later, we can hear from the first date and second date uh, on Monday and so on. So uh, that recording also can you can find uh, to visit by Google, uh, Aoyamagaku University Institute for Global International Relations. Uh, you can see, even though it is a midnight of uh, United States of America, or very early morning in uh, uh, Europe, you can uh, find the uh, keynote speech uh, in another day as well. Lastly, uh, audiences and panelists, please come in the uh, evening, 9.15 9, uh, in, the, in the evening, in European time, uh, one, uh, 15 afternoon and in the United States uh, early morning 7 15 in the morning we will have a toast a second day's toast so please come with your wine beer sake or uh, tea uh, you can discuss with our panelist or uh, you can have a discussion very short time 10 or 15 minutes so do not forget uh, the time, 9.15. So really, thank you very much coming to this very important and interesting conference. And uh, especially sorry about uh, the uh, Mr. Uh, Sawamura in the very midnight in the uh, United States of America. And all of the presenters, uh, Professor Kibata, Professor Jindu, and uh, Minister uh, Klaus Witze. Uh, so interesting presentation. And uh, we also very much thank you, uh, appreciate to Professor Mizobata and all of the audiences. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, all of the presenters. Thank you very much. We close and next session start six o'clock. Thank you. Goodbye. See you. <laughs>